Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so this is uh, one of our, our first West Six Says in Science of 2021. Um, tonight, our speakers are Dr. Donna Arnett and Dr. Becky Dutch. Uh, Dr. Arnett earned her doctorate in epidemiology from the University of North Carolina, at Chapel Hill, and is currently the, the Dean of the University of Kentucky College of Public Health and the professor in the Department of Epidemiology. Dr. Dutch earned her doctorate in biochemistry from Stanford University and is currently a professor of molecular and cellular biochemistry at UK. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Arnett and Dr. Dutch. And I did forget a couple housekeeping issues. Um, everyone's going to be muted um, during the presentation. Um, you will have the ability to unmute yourself once we enter the question and answer um, section. So if you'd like to hold your, your questions until the end, that would be great. If you want to go ahead and type a question into the chat, we can get to those at the end. Um, and just for everyone's knowledge, the, this presentation is being recorded. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Arnett and Dr. Dutch. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. We really appreciate the opportunity uh, to come and speak to you tonight about COVID-19 and the vaccine creation. Um, as he mentioned, I am the Dean of the College of Public Health here at the University of Kentucky and an epidemiologist. So uh, it's really a pleasure to be able to use my epidemiology skills to hopefully um, teach you tonight just a little bit about many of the things that you've probably heard and seen about COVID-19, but maybe didn't understand. And then Dr. Dutch is really gonna go into detail about how these vaccines have been created. Um, and we'll wrap up with some myth busting about these vaccines as well. So every morning um, I check on the New York Times where you can go every day and check for this information as well. This was the latest update for the current state of COVID-19 in the US as of this morning at 7.54 AM. And so you'll see that this is what's known in epidemiology as an epidemic curve. So since the inception of the epidemic in March, um, we see as new cases accumulate, these are every day, all of the cases that occurred in that day. And what we would have loved to have seen is for the curve to go up and then go down. Um, you heard in the, in the spring when the epidemic started that we would have a second wave. We did have this wave in the summer and then we started with a bigger wave in the fall. Um, and it really um, escalated primarily after Thanksgiving holiday here. So you see a big peak after Thanksgiving. And then right after Christmas, we saw a, an even greater peak. So we've started to see a decline again, and, and that's confirmed today in Kentucky. We had um, the fourth, fourth uh, week in a row with lower cases on a Monday. Overall in the nation, we've had 25 million cases and over 14 days that represents about a 33% decline um, from that big peak that we saw after the holidays. Um, and nationally, we've seen a reduction in deaths by about 5%. Typically deaths will follow two, weeks after, two to four weeks after one of these peaks. So in Kentucky, if you drill down within that map on the New York Times website, Kentucky really mirrors that overall national picture. So in July, we had our, we, we really did a great job of flattening the curve here from March until July. Um, and then we picked up some in July and the, the July 4th holiday yielded this, um, these smaller peaks under here. Um, but really, once we got into the fall and the holiday season, you see Kentucky follow that very same pattern that we see nationally. And we've also noted this decline. So we've had about a 32% drop over the last 14 days. But what is disturbing is our death rate actually has gone up over the past um, 14 days by 23%. So that's how you read the epidemic curves um, as you're following along on, on the New York Times. So this is another dashboard that all of you can have access to. Um, it, if you just Google um, Kentucky COVID-19 dashboard, you'll find this dashboard that's updated every day. And it's got a lot of information on it. 
um, that you can stay up to date with the epidemic in our state. So one of the bad uh, elements of today's map is this is our map of all 120 counties in Kentucky and all but six of those counties are in the red zone, which means our, we're in that very highest rate of incidence. Um, we have overall about 60 new cases per 100,000 as our eight average daily, daily new cases. This is the epidemic curve that I just showed you from the New York Times, but this is from Kentucky's own data as well. It's the same curve, um, which is good. Um, and the other interesting piece of data that you can get from this is the case, case numbers by age group. So what you'll see in Kentucky is that it's the, the number of cases is really highest in the 20 to 29 year olds. Um, it's pretty high in the, teen, in the 10 to 20 year olds, but the peak is really in that 20 to 29 year old, which has a lot of importance as we come to Becky's part of the discussion where we talk about the vaccine, because even though the, the case number is highest, you'll see that there are almost no deaths in this group. So this age group may feel quite protected um, from COVID-19 because they won't die. Um, but what, what the downside of that is, is that most of the deaths are happening in our most vulnerable populations, which are the elderly. And so if these 20 to 29 year olds go home and visit their grandparents, you know, they can unknowingly spread that disease um, to their grandparents. And even though overall the, the fatality rate is about one to 2%, which by the way, is no, no small number. That's about 10 times more lethal than the flu. But in this age group and those over 80, it's about 12% mortality rate. So that's a really high mortality rate. And the reason why uh, we're very happy here to talk to you tonight about the importance of vaccination. So I wanted to give you a graphic to show you why um, this concept of herd immunity is so important. It means that when you get a sufficient number of people who are immune and that immunity could come from vaccination, for example, you really can stop the spread of the disease um, to other people who may not be able to be vaccinated. Maybe they um, have immunocompromised states like being very old or having an organ transplant, or they're very young, they're an infant. So they can't be vaccinated at that, at that point. So herd immunity means that if enough of us get immunity from the, the virus, then we can protect those who could not be vaccinated. So in this graphic, this black dot that's going to be in the center of each one of these graphs represents the infected person. The yellow dots represent people who are vaccinated. And the blue dots are those who are um, unvaccinated. So I'm going to start it now. And you'll see what happens um, when you have no vaccine versus when you have vaccinations at different levels. So you see in the top left with no vaccination, you get this very rapid increase in infection. It really goes through the whole population. Even at 25%, it's, do, it's, it's still reaching a large number of people. And at 50%, you know, more than half the population um, is being infected at the end of that period. Um, but you'll see that if we get up to levels of 95%, the disease may still occur, but it's going to be much more rare than those where there's even 50 or 75% vaccination. So I'll run that again, just so you can see how dramatic um, infections can be with a novel virus. So what we mean by novel is this coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, has never been seen in the human population. So we have no natural immunity to it. So really the only way to become immune is to be vaccinated. So vaccinations are really the critical step for ending this pandemic. So I've shown you the graphic when uh, before and how things spread. When no one is immunized, you really spread to many people you still, even when some of the population is immunized, you still get a lot of um, 
transmission through the population. But when most of the population is immunized, you really um, constrain the spread of that disease. So now I want to turn it over to Becky and let her talk to you about how these vaccines were created. And then afterwards, we'll do some myth busting. So just a little heads up. So, so the question I sure would be asked, why am I sitting here doing this? I'm a biochemist. Um, but I'm actually a biochemist who spent my entire life study, studying respiratory viruses and much of it on emerging respiratory viruses. That's what we do. All of my work is in virology and has been for decades. Um, and so what I wanna to talk to you just a little bit now, and then we're at the end with questions if people want more details, I'm happy to provide them. It's a question of what do these vaccines actually do? Um, so because we talk about vaccines, but getting an injection, most people kind of want to know what's actually going to go in their arm, what's going to happen. So if you can switch to the next slide, Donna. Um, so if you think a year ago, the, the data on SARS-CoV-2 was really just coming out. We'd known for a few weeks that this uh, China had reported that this novel coronavirus is here. And by this time a year ago, they'd released the entire sequence. So we knew essentially every all the details on what's called the genome, the genetic material of this virus. And as soon as we had that, um, scientists and virologists around the world were starting to plan vaccines. So one thing to be aware is this effort started immediately as soon as there was information. Um, and all the way back in the spring, um, when I was asked if I thought we'd have a successful vaccine, because vaccine making is not always easy, one of the things I've said is, I, the thing that gave me great confidence was the number of different places that were trying things and the different approaches they were using. So this just actually shows you a report from Nature, which is a major journal back in the spring, showing you the number of different vaccines that were in development. And they had eight different types of vaccines that were that, that, that we're starting to try to make. So I think by the time all was said and done, we had several hundred different manufacturers working to make a vaccine. So if you ever ask the question, well, it seems surprising that these ones just worked. We have the two that may, two already that are approved that have been done great and another likely coming soon, but all sorts of ones that were tested, some of which didn't work well at all. But the effort started a year ago and it started very intensely. Um, and they made sure to approach it in lots of different ways. So if you go to the next slide, this just shows you this idea that when we sat there a year ago, we didn't know what would work. So one way to approach that is to come up with a variety of different ways to try to make a vaccine. And I will say that every single one of these, so you actually, um, so what you see in the very left is just kind of a model of what the SARS-CoV-2 uh, capsid structure looks like, what this virus looks like. And sticking out from that virus, you see those things that look like a uh, red little, um, uh, golf tees, basically. That's supposed to look like the spike protein. That's a, that's a protein on the surface of the virus. It's, it's, think of it as the target that our immune system is going to recognize. And every single one of these vaccines, what their biggest goal was to get some version of that protein in so our bodies could start to recognize it. And they had lots of different ways they tried it. They tried inactivated vaccines. That's just a virus that's been killed, and then you can put it in. You tried ones that you made less, less, less um, what's called virulent, less able to make people ill. Um, if anybody's ever had the flu mist vaccine that goes in your nose for influenza virus, that's an attenuated virus, uh, something that's been made not as dangerous. They had ones where they just made that spike protein all by itself and, and tried injecting it. They had pieces of the spike protein they put in. They put the spike protein to other things that it could that could just be carried on the surface. They've tried all of these and some of those are still ongoing, but they had a couple of methods and we're gonna cover these. One is what they see here, H, rep re replication and competent vectors. Um, we're gonna talk about that for what's called something called an adenovirus. And then the other one that appears to have worked very well is something called RNA vaccines. But I wanna stress that all of these approaches have been being utilized across the world to try to make this, these vaccines for coronaviruses. Um, and I think that's important as you try to think about how did we manage to get something that is successful in as quick a period as we did. So if you go to the next slide, what I wanted to do is really just talk briefly 
about the two types of vaccines you're most likely to be offered if you haven't already been in the, in the coming months. Um, the first are what are called messenger RNA vaccines. There's two of them. Um, one is made by Pfizer, which is a company we all hear a lot about here in conjunction with a German company called BioNTech. Um, the second one is made by Moderna. Moderna actually has ties to our National Institutes of Health. Um, and I, so these companies, um, actually both of them, BioNTech and Moderna have been working on messenger RNA vaccines to other things for quite a long time, 15 years or so. Um, so what is it seeing? What's an mRNA vaccine? So you remember, look, if you look over in the corner, you'll see that again, a little schematic of a virus. In this case, it's that red thing we're trying to make a copy of. How could you do that? Well, normally what happens is that virus, when it gets in your body, if you, caught, if you, if you have COVID, you have virus in your body, that virus gets inside the cells of your body and it releases its genetic material. And part of that is a message. That's why it's called a messenger. It's a message that basically says to the cell, this is how you make the spike protein. Here's, here's the information right here. Go ahead and make it. And our cells make lots and lots of the viral proteins because they've been given the message. And just like they usually get messages on how to make our normal proteins. So to mimic that, what these vaccines do, they just give the one little piece of message for the spike protein. The rest of the virus is gone. Normally the virus would have all sorts of messages in it. It just has the one. And instead of letting a virus bring it in, they stick it inside something called a lipid particle um, so that it'll get into you and you inject it into your, into your muscle. And when that gets injected in, the cells take up that messenger RNA. And just like if you got infected, they'll recognize this is a message I can make a protein from. They'll make the spike protein. But again, it's a foreign protein. As soon as we make it and the cells make it and it gets out there, our immune system says, uh-uh, we don't like this. This isn't us. Let's make a response to it. So essentially, the messenger RNA just gets rid of all the rest of the infection. You don't need a virus particle. You don't need the rest of the virus material, just the one message. But that one message produces one protein, and that one protein turns on our immune system. So that's the idea behind a messenger RNA vaccine. And if you go to the next slide, Donna, this gives you a little bit more detail. This is kind of the molecular details of this if, you, if people are interested. And so basically the messenger RNA vaccine, it's kind of, it's, they put it inside what's called a lipid coat. Now that might sound a little scary, except you know what? Our cells are all have lipid coats. The virus, the coronavirus normally has a lipid coat. These lipid coats are, we have lipids all through our body. That just means the fat layer outside that, that, that protects our cells. Once that finds a cell and gets taken in, that messenger RNA gets released out. You make these spike proteins, you see them in the middle, the little, the little uh, red things. And when they get out, the immune system realizes there's, there's an issue and you'll get two types of immunity. You get your antibodies turning on. On the right, you show antibody mediated immunity. So you get first antibodies and then what's called memory cells, which are like cells waiting for another spike protein to come in your body six months from now. And as soon as they see it, they are primed and ready. The other thing you get are what are called cell mediated immunity, which are called T cells. And that's a different way of protecting yourself, but both things get turned on by the presence of this foreign protein. So if you have been offered or get offered in the near future, um, either the Pfizer vaccine or the Moderna vaccine, this is essentially what's gonna be going on when you get that shot in your arm. And I will say I had the, the Moderna vaccine two weeks ago. Um, and other than a sore arm, I did have a slightly sore arm, but I get that with flu shots and other things too, but it was totally fine. But it's kind of nice for me to think this is what's going on. We are getting that, that spike protein made. My body is getting revved and ready. So that's the one we have right now. Now I wanna go through one other type of vaccine because we may well have this option soon. So there's a second type of vaccine that has progressed really well. So if you go to the next slide, there are two companies that are making, well, there's many companies that are making them, but there are two have been very successful making what's called an adenovirus vaccine. So adenovirus is a small virus, generally associated with colds, um, but adenoviruses have been used for gene therapy. Adenoviruses have been used for several things because you can take some of it out and you can put in a new message instead. And so what Johnson & Johnson, or Jams who works at Janssen Pharmaceuticals um, here in the US, or AstraZeneca, which is housed both in the US and in the United Kingdom, 
have done is to create ad an adenovirus vaccines that have that same spike message, spike protein message stuck in them. So instead of just putting the message in a lipid coat, they put that message inside this virus. These are actually more stable than the lipids. So you may have read that the Moderna and um, Pfizer vaccines have to be kept really cold. That's because of that lipid that they're in. The adenoviruses are actually um, much more stable. So you can generally store these at, in the fridge temperatures. So all that happens if you look on the right is you think of the red in the middle, that's the message for the spike protein. This virus gets taken up into a cell that message gets put into the cell nucleus and it gets made into messenger RNA. And then we have the same thing as a messenger RNA vaccine that gets made into spike protein. It turns on T and B cell responses. Um, the reason I bring these up is that there's a very good chance you'll read within the next few weeks about Johnson & Johnson getting in what's called an emergency use authorization. That's why we're using what's, both Moderna and Pfizer have those for their vaccines. Johnson & Johnson's final trial, the phase two, three trial rollouts are gonna be out very, very soon. Um, and the word on the street is that we may well, they think they can produce 100 million doses by end of March. So it's a good chance that you'll have Moderna, Pfizer, and Johnson & Johnson all vaccinating with, by that period of time. Um, can't guarantee it until the EUA comes out, but I wanted to prime you for it. If you look at the next slide, just one more example of how these adenovirus vaccines work. This case, this comes from AstraZeneca. AstraZeneca's vaccine is not yet approved in the US, but it is approved in Europe and in the UK. And so the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, in case you're wondering, is what's called adenovirus 26, which is a human one. The, the AstraZeneca vaccine that Europe is using uses a chimp adenovirus which is very close to ours, but is exactly the same thing. They modify it so it absolutely can't cause disease. They stick in a little bit of that SARS spike protein. You put that into the body and it, it turns on the immune response. So those are the two types of vaccines you're very likely to be dealing with this year. Messenger RNA vaccines, adenovirus vaccines. And then the last slide before we go on to the myths I wanted to show you is I know that one of the concerns people sometimes say is, wow, this is really fast. Do I, do I trust this? This went really fast. So I want to go through just a little bit about how this would normally work compared to how it did work and why. So up in the top is the normal slow speed for a vaccine. And yes, it is absolutely true that a lot of vaccines take 15 years to get approved. We're dealing with one that's been approved in like 10 months to a year and a half. Why is this so different? Well, a number of things. Uh, number one, the initial studies for this one, how did they know what to go after? They could base that on what we already knew about coronaviruses. So we've had two other very, very serious coronavirus pandemics, but we don't talk about them because the US wasn't hit much. The SARS coronavirus vaccine, the or, uh, epidemic, the first one back in 2002, um, only killed a little over 8,000 people in the world but its mortality rate for, for that virus was about 10%, um, very scary. And so they started developing vaccines immediately for that one, including messenger RNA vaccines. In fact, Moderna had, went through phase one trials with a messenger RNA vaccine for SARS. The other coronavirus, MERS, actually still exists in the world. It just doesn't move from person to person very well, thank goodness, because its mortality rate's about 40%. But again, they knew from that those viruses, what the target should be, how they probably should design these. Honestly, Moderna's vaccine just took what they'd done for SARS and shifted it to SARS-CoV-2. So a lot of the initial years of trying to figure out what you would target, we could, we could jump over because we knew more because of the previous coronavirus outbreaks. The other thing they did is to overlap the phases. So phase one is safety. Put it into people, make sure that they don't have some kind of reaction. It's a small trial. Make sure that there doesn't have some of a danger phase. Then phase two is usually a little bit bigger and phase three is a lot bigger. In this case, because of the seriousness of the pandemic, as soon as enough phase one people had been analyzed to be, to, to, to be high level of confidence, there wasn't a serious side effect. They could start phase two and they overlapped two and three. Essentially, they were following the data as they were scaling up. But the total number of people that were examined did not go down. We've had so we've had large numbers of people examined with these viruses and the trials themselves, I think it was 30,000 for Pfizer, 40,000 for Moderna, in that range for Johnson and Johnson, in that range for AstraZeneca. Um, so 
the same amount of data just generated in a, in a more rapid time scale and, and the rollout was done much more efficiently. Um, and the other thing that was very different is usually companies wait to start making a lot of this vaccine till they know it's gonna work. So they wait till they get all their approval and everything is through before they start to scale it up. But because of the seriousness of this pandemic, companies that felt when their phase two, three trials were looking promising, the scale up was already going on. Now, the risk of that is that obviously if it doesn't work, you don't, you have to throw away the vaccine you've made. And, and in many cases, there was federal support both here and then in other countries to help with these. But that's the reason we went so fast. Can't do this for every virus, it's expensive, um, but given the nature of this pandemic, that's why we went at that speed. So that's kind of an introduction to the science behind him. And we'll talk a little bit about myths. I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Arnett. And then again, at the end, we are happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Becky. So I did want to give you um, very specifics about Kentucky's COVID vaccination plan. Uh, the federal government distributes vaccines to the states and the states are allowed to create their own prioritization. So I, I will say most states are following something similar, but, um, but they're not identical. So our governor um, worked with his cabinet to create this specific prioritization for the state of Kentucky, and it's the one we're following now. So first off, you remember that most of the deaths are happening in long-term care facilities in older people. Um, so the first priority was getting the most vulnerable vaccinated. So long-term care facilities, assisted living facilities were targeted first, along with those frontline healthcare workers. And that was called phase 1A. And we are through phase 1A. There's still, um, you can check the, this website I put for you. Every day it's updated with how many have been vaccinated. The goal is to use 90% of the vaccine within seven days. So um, we have a very aggressive goal of doing that. Now we've received 345,800 doses so far and have administered 224,000 of those doses. We're now in phase 1B. So phase 1B includes first responders, so police, firemen, EMS, anyone age 70 or older, and what's unique about Kentucky versus our st states around us, we are also vaccinating K through 12 school personnel. So um, getting all of the teachers and people working in the schools vaccinated. And that's the phase we're in right now. Our next phase will be 1C. And, and that 1C phase brings it down to the next level of age risk. So age 60 or older, or anyone age 16 or older with these what are called high risk conditions that the CDC has labeled. That's things like smoking, being diabetic, being severely obese, having heart disease, um, chronic kidney disease are some examples of those high risk categories. Um, hopefully by March or April will be to level two. I think a lot of it, as Becky has explained, Dr. Dutch has explained, depends on when this uh, next wave of vaccines, the adenovirus vaccines are, are going to be released um, because we, we really are limited by the availability of vaccines right now. But phase two we're hoping happens um, around March or April. And then phase three is just anyone 16 or years or older. We're still gathering data that Dr. Butch may wanna comment on what we're doing in children for safety uh, checks right now. Um, but the next phase will be 16 or older, and then finally children under the age of 16, if we actually get um, approvals for that part of the population. We have to, the FDA has to oversee safety and make sure enough have been tested. So you should know where you stand relative to these three, these categories, one, A, B, C, two, three, four, because that's going to determine when you're going to be vaccinated. Every person that's vaccinated, there has to be a reason attached to that vaccine record that goes to the state every day that says, you know, this is why this person was vaccinated. So I wanted you to be aware of that because if you have some frustration because you've tried to get a vaccine, um, know that, that where you stand in this, in this priority ranking is really determining 
your ability to get a vaccine right now. So finally, Becky, Dr. Dutch, and I wanted to go through some myth busters because there's been a lot of, um, well, social media always yields some crazy kinds of hypotheses of, about vaccines. Um, it's always been a, an area of high contention, but there's a lot of myths that came up around this one. So we thought we'd go through them. We're going to just go back and forth, um, and then we're going to open it for questions. So the first, the first myth is that the vaccines have just been developed too fast and they're unsafe. And I think Dr. Dutch has given you a, a lot of explanation about why that's not true. Um, beyond just the, the other upper respiratory diseases that she mentioned, you know, these messenger RNA vaccines have been used in at least three other infectious diseases safely. They've been through phase one testing, but there hasn't been a big need to develop them. I mean, it's, it's really this global pandemic um, and all of the effort globally that's gone into making a vaccine fast and effective um, and safe that made it happen. So they are safe um, and you should feel completely safe in using them. So Becky, why don't you talk about immunity? All right, so I have had COVID and I have immunity, I shouldn't get vaccinated. Um, so the challenge is that when you get COVID naturally, people mount an immune response, but how strong a response you mount is very some person to person. And the data suggests that some, for instance, if you had a pretty mild infection, some people have a pretty a lukewarm immune response, okay? We also don't know for sure how long our natural immunity to, to this particular virus is gonna last. Um, for some viruses, we get lifelong immunity. For others, we get several years. Um, and so if you've had COVID already, Getting the shot, all it will do is boost your immunity, but not getting the shot may mean you leave yourself vulnerable because you didn't mount that strong a response in your first, when you were first infected. And so it's the reason they, they recommend that you go ahead and have the shot anyway. So some people claim that the vaccine has serious side effects. Um, and so I, I wanted to put into perspective, you know, when, when 40, um, thousand doses of the vaccine were issued, there were a few people who had a severe allergic response. Now, they were cured from that allergic response with an EpiPen or epinephrine, the same thing that's in an EpiPen. So it didn't have any um, life altering consequences in terms of that serious side effect. And it is the reason why when you go to be vaccinated, they will ask you to stay there for at least 15 minutes. And if you've had um, vaccine reactions in the past, they'll ask you to stay longer so that they can monitor you for um, any kind of allergic serious reaction and give you epinephrine um, and, and that will be the end of it. So the next one is more people will die from vaccine side effects than virus. Well, considering the US alone, we've had 400,000 people die from, from COVID so far. Um, that's a big number. So, so far, we don't have data to suggest anyone has died from vaccine side effects. Um, Dr. Arnett or Donna, and you guys can call me Becky in the questions, please feel free to. Um, so far, we've had people with some, some of these uh, reactions like she's talking about where you have an, um, an allergic re type reaction. There's also, they're monitoring pretty carefully. There's a study out of Norway that suggested maybe some very, very, very high risk older people you can get a fever from these and maybe the fever was an issue. The problem is so far there's no data that they had an increased risk of death. If, if they were already 95 and frail, what was their general risk? And did, they, did that go up when they were vaccinated? Because they're vaccinating you know, many, many tens of thousands of people in that age range. Um, but we've been, they've been following all this really carefully and this seems to be a very safe vaccine. We don't have evidence that people are dying from it at all. And so when you weigh that compared to your relative risk, um, that makes this seem like it's not a concern. So the next, the next uh, myth is that the vaccine has microchips that are tracking our brain. And this evidently was started on social media because the Gates Foundation had said that they were going to digitally track the vax who had had the vaccine. 
I, I think they meant like an electronic health record, digital tracking. Um, and somehow on the on social media, it became the, a microchip. There is nothing in the, the, the messenger RNA or the other vaccine that, that Becky described that has a microchip. It's purely that messenger RNA. It's just a strand of RNA, uh, not a microchip. Okay, the vaccine is going to alter your DNA. That one's been out there. This is not a retrovirus. So if you were to get HIV, HIV will actually integrate into your DNA. This is not. Uh, coronaviruses in general don't do that. They are RNA-based viruses that don't ever make DNA out of themselves. And there's no evidence whatsoever that the messenger RNA would do that. And there's no evidence that you've ever, we have no, no good evidence that this has ever happened. We're not quite sure where that rumor came from, but probably because people confused any virus infection with a HIV infection and assumed that that would be the same thing, and it's not. The vaccines were developed using fetal tissue. Again, we don't know where this came from, but there's absolutely uh, no use of fetal tissue in any of the vaccines that have been developed and tested for um, COVID-19. Vaccines cause infertility or miscarriage. There's a specific reason this one came about and it's wrong. Um, so the spike protein, the protein we talked about, that protein on the surface of the virus is what's called a viral fusion protein. It causes, it, it fuses the membrane of the virus to the membrane of the cell, makes the two come together. And it's a certain type of fusion protein. It's called a class one fusion protein. And there's lots of viruses that have class one fusion proteins. Flu does, Ebola does, um, the other coronaviruses all do. But sperm egg fusion in humans has a protein called syncytion that is also a class one fusion protein that's involved in sperm egg fusion. So they're both, they're all class one fusion proteins. Um, Somewhere out there, the rumor got that if you developed an immune reaction to one class one fusion protein, it would mean you couldn't have this, the, the other ones wouldn't work. But if you really think about it, that makes no sense. First, they're very different. Their sequences, everything about them are very different. That would be like saying, Matt, Matt's a guy, a guy committed this crime, therefore Matt committed the crime. No, we all know that you have to get down into the details to know what's going on. Sorry, Matt, not in to pick on you, but since you're hosting. Um, so we know that's not true. And we know that these proteins are, 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 are very different from each other. We also know that this, if the presence of the spike protein caused this problem, all the people who got infected would have had this problem with SARS-CoV-2 or with any of the other coronaviruses that we pretty much all had multiple times in our lives. So that one is not true. And the next one that's not true is I'm allergic to eggs, so I should not take the vaccine. Now there are some vaccines that are built around eggs. Yeah, right? the Becky, flu vaccine, she knows yeah, how the flu vaccine is grown in eggs. So, um, but this is not, there's, there's no eggs involved whatsoever. So egg allergies should not prohibit you from taking it. And the last one on our list, vaccines must be stored at low temperatures because of preservatives. No, the reason that the mRNA vaccines have to have low temperatures is that nanolipid, the nanoparticle of lipid on the outside, that's pretty fragile. Um, and as I said, the, the, the adenovirus vaccines won't have that low temperature requirement because they have a, a tougher shell on the outside. That has nothing to do with preservatives. So those are the myths that we hope to bust. One last thing I did want to, to mention, um, because the new, the new um, vaccine that's coming out requires just one dose, but the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines require a booster. So if you get either the Moderna or Pfizer in 21 to 28 days, it depends on which one, you're going to have to go and have a follow-up booster um, to be fully effective. And the effect, effective rate is about 95%. So it's really, they're both very effective, but you have to get both of them, both the initial and the booster. All right, we are ready, I think, for questions. Uh, if no one has a question to get started, I'll, I'll start us off. Um, Earlier in the presentation, you were talking about all the different types of vaccines that were in development and they were just kind of, it was almost like a shotgun approach and like yep. seeing what, what sticks. 
is it advantageous to have multiple like different types of vaccines out in the population or does it not really matter in the end? No, it has less to do with needing them out in the population and more to do with a year ago, we had no idea which ones would really work. So I often, I joke, but I often think that people who aren't scientists think we know more than we do, but we can't predict for sure which will be the most effective. And we've had some respiratory viruses that they've not been very successful at making vaccines. So if you got something this serious, the best way to go at it is just to try a ton of different approaches and you see which one works. And that's the reason. Yeah, I guess and I, I think was... we had we had the federal support to do that too with yeah. Operation Warp Speed and and globally a lot of, of companies came together and countries came together to make this happen. I guess I was I was more thinking if we had like an mRNA vaccine versus like a, a different type of a different type of vaccine, would that potentially protect us from like if one was better against other variants versus others? And if you if you spread out the different types that are effective, does it kind of diversify our immunity enough that it? So given that effective? most of those are targeting the spike protein, I don't know that you'd have a wide difference now. The variance is a good question. Moderna's already said they're going to be looking at maybe they make an additional booster you could use to uh, deal, particularly the South African variant that's out. May, maybe it doesn't look like it's ineffective. It just may not be slightly as effective, but they're tracking these really closely. Um, but since all of those different methods hit the same thing, um, I'm not sure, and right, that, that it would be beneficial. Um, and right now we're asking if someone's had Moderna to begin with, someone just asked this question, if you had Moderna, you have Moderna again as a booster. If you've had Pfizer, you have Pfizer again as a booster. So you don't boost with a different one at this point because we haven't, nobody's gone in and done the trials to look at how that, what does that do to your protection? So uh, for now, we think the answer is this is just lots of tries to get where we are, but they're gonna keep studying it, Matt. So it's possible a year from now, they'll realize that actually you get an even better response if you start with Moderna and then you boost with Johnson & Johnson, but nobody's done those studies. Uh, Dr. Annette and Dr. Dutch, there are a few questions in the chat. The first one is, I have seen conversations online about not wanting to quote, stress out their immune system and quote, by taking both doses of the mRNA COVID-19 vaccine. Could you speak to this misconception? Well, let me just first say your immune system is built to be stressed, okay? Mm -hmm. There's even a theory, there's reasonable theories that it's a problem sometimes that we try to not stress our immune system. Our immune system is built to respond to challenges on a daily basis. Um, I think we, we don't tend to, well, I do because I work in infectious diseases, but we don't tend to think a lot about just how much you are barraged with stuff on a daily basis and your immune system is constantly responding. You know, you think about kids, good grief, my kids used to maybe don't, don't report me or anything. You know, they go out in the playground, the next thing you know, they have a mouthful of dirt, right? Their immune systems are built for that. And in fact, keeping them too clean may be a problem. So the idea that unless you have a reason to think you have a depleted immune system, and your doctor has told you to be cautious, your immune system's built for this. So no, go for it. Um, the only thing that they're asking you not to do with these vaccines is don't get another vaccine for something different right before you get this one, because they want to make sure that that you don't have extra things going on all at the same time. But honestly, that's a step. They're just trying to be incredibly cautious because when you do this, when you vaccinate kids, you often get more than one thing and the immune system tends, it, it does just great. I'll just second what Becky said. It, she is absolutely correct. The, the germ theory is, uh, it's more than a theory. You know, the more that we can expose ourselves, I'm not saying we should do it with COVID, but, you know, to just natural um, things in our, in our household and in our community, the more uh, acquired immunity we get. So there's a question about what protection do you have from the first Pfizer vaccine? And I'm assuming you mean from the first dose. Yeah. So in the first week you get um, up to about 45% protection. It takes the booster to get to the 95%. And Becky, it's about four weeks from beginning to that 95%. So, yeah, and, and you know, the, that number after the first dose is depends on which study you look. It's anything from that 40 some number to about 80, depending on which way they did the analysis. 
you do have protection after dose one. It's just not the level where you could feel confident you're not going to get sick. I mean, these the mRNA vaccines are impressive in that even with that 95% level, the other thing that you need to know is they don't have a case of someone who's had serious COVID, like hospitalized COVID for people who've been vaccinated. That's the percentage that got some kind of symptoms. So they're really important um, and really effective. The first dose is gonna protect you some. Uh, for instance, I've had the first dose because I'm in the College of Medicine and I do work with viruses and patient samples and stuff. My husband hasn't. I'm more likely to go to Kroger right now because I figure I have some protection. So Becky, this is more of a question for you. Um, can you talk about adjuvants and whether or not there are any in the vaccines? So that's a great question, Carrie. I don't believe there are in these vaccines. The mRNA vaccines don't need adjuvants. I don't, I haven't looked, and either the adenovirus one shouldn't. Usually adjuvants are done because they help stimulate your immune system and they're usually done with protein vaccines where you have like, if you just had to put the stars as protein in a body, but I'm not 100% sure about that. So I want to be a little careful, but the, the mRNA ones don't need it. And I don't believe the adenovirus ones ever use it either. So we had a question um, also around um, the science on immunosuppressants and vaccines. And this is an area I know of real, real intense interest because the very people who are most at risk, we don't know the science yet about safety and efficacy in those, in those groups. Becky, do you know more? So the biggest question I think is whether you get a nice response here I believe they've tested some immunosuppressed people and they haven't been, they haven't had to say by bad side effects, because if you think about it, the mRNA vaccine is just giving you that messenger RNA. The adenovirus vaccine is an inactivated virus that can't do anything. So the fact that your immune system can't suppress them doesn't leave you vulnerable to an infection. And, and you would never want to get, for instance, a, what's called an attenuated virus vaccine. It's not quite as good because your immune system may still have trouble with it. Um, but I, the doctors are working on that. Um, Donna mentioned or, uh, when she was talking about vaccinations that the, that under 16 group is not being vaccinated. And it's the same kind of thing as with this. It's not because we know it's a problem. It's because the way the rules work, you can't license a vaccine in an age group or in a certain type, someone, a, a certain, it, someone with certain characteristics unless you've actually done a trial involving them. So none of the trials involved under 16. That's why we can't vaccinate under 16. Um, people ask, what about older people? Yes, those vaccine trials included older people because if they wanted to release it to older people, they had to be involved. I believe that there were some immunosuppressed people in the trials, but the best thing I would suggest is talk to your doctor specifically about their recommendation for the vaccine, particularly if it turns out you're going to have an option between M you know, the mRNA and the other, if he, has a, he or she has a, 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 what they think is the best advice for what to take. Yeah. And, and again, the mRNA vaccines are just that one piece of the protein that, that codes the messenger RNA that codes the spike protein. So you're not getting a whole virus, you're getting that one thing right. because that spike protein goes through this ACE2 receptor that receives it into our cells and it's the way it gets in and becomes activated. So that's all that's in that entire M mRNA vaccine. So you're not getting the full virus. So there's a question that we have a very educated audience, clearly. You mentioned a T cell reaction. Can that take place in people with suppressed, suppressed B cells? Um, the answer is, I would guess yes, but I'm sure that study's not been done yet. So because of the speed at which these have been released, all sorts of things like that, they still have to test. It's the same reason that you're being advised to wear your mask after you get the vaccine. The question is, we don't, we, they haven't been able to, to know yet if we still spread the virus, if we can have enough of an infection that we spread after being vaccinated. They don't want to say you can't until they've actually done the study. Now, if I was a betting person, I would be betting a lot of money that transmission is going to be vastly decreased in vaccinated people because you transmit because you get all sorts of virus growing in your upper respiratory tract. If the virus, if the vaccine means you don't get those symptoms going, you don't have as much virus, you're not going to transmit. But they're not going to say that till they've got the study done. And it's the same. Even, even, even if you 
get COVID with a vaccine, which yeah. we don't think is, is going to happen very often. But even if you did, your viral load's probably going to be remarkably less. Right. And we do know, we know the vaccine. viral load, we know viral load has to do with how well you transmit. So I guess I've done it's the same thing with this one. I have guessed yes, because the presentation should allow that. And, and we know actually T cell response is very important for COVID response, but they just, I haven't seen any data. So that's just based on my guess about what else we know about COVID, not about the vaccines. Okay, hey, well, I guess if there's uh, no more questions, um, let's just thank our speakers again for giving a great talk. Um, yeah, and look out on the, I guess the Suds and Science Facebook page for upcoming virtual events till we're through this pandemic. <laughs> thank you, Matt. I guess Becky and I get a free beer at some point. We'll come visit you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> when, when we're allowed to go to West Six again, let us know, yeah. yeah. Let us know. Got it. Thank you. All right. Thank All right. you.